I'll be reading Genesis 12, one to, uh, verses 1 to 3. Is this it here? The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. John 1, 2. Isaiah and John. Okay. Do you want me to put this on there, or do you want to say it? Um, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Verse 6. For, for to us a child is born to give us a son to give, in, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from the time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The Lord's anger against us. And then John. Hey. Hang on. <laughs> okay. 546 to 47. Sorry. Okay. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I have said? The word of the Lord. Thank you, Sharon. Great. Um, okay. So we are in the middle of a month-long discussion about sharing our faith, about evangelism. Sometimes the term evangelism can bring about feelings of fear and anxiety, but we decided to focus on this area for this month because really we're exploring for the whole year what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And sharing Jesus is an important aspect of being a follower of Jesus, being a, a student or a disciple of Jesus. Sharing our faith is, a, is an important part of growing as a disciple. So it's important for us to, to develop clarity about what the gospel is and to gain confidence in how we share the gospel, how we share our faith in Jesus. And so think just in your own mind uh, for a moment about how it is that you came to follow Jesus. How did you come to follow Jesus? If you were like me and you came to, to faith not as a child, but as a teen or as an adult, you can probably think of somebody who was influential in helping you to become a Christian and or helping you to start to figure out what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Uh, if you were raised in the church and you're a teen or a late teen or an adult, that means that you made the decision at some point to continue following Jesus. Or you might still be in the process of making that decision, which is awesome. Either way, there are or have been people in your life who influenced you toward following Jesus. 
Let's just pause in silence, in silence for a moment, while we think about who it is or who it was who had a significant impact on you as you chose to follow Jesus. Just pause for a second and think about that. See, the truth is that the Christian faith was at some point shared with us, and that is why we are following Jesus. Somebody, uh, possibly a pastor, way more likely a friend or an acquaintance, shared their faith with you, shared Jesus with you. And God was active in that sharing, both in the words shared and in your heart as you were responding. And so, yeah, eventually you responded yes. Now, last week, last week, I gave Pastor Jonathan the daunting uh, task of preaching on what is the gospel. What is the gospel? And he did an excellent job. And, and here is his summary statement. The gospel, the loving creator, God, is restoring his creation through the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, and we can be part of it. And I think that that is an excellent summary statement. But of course, the gospel is too large and too impactful and too beautiful to be completely summarized by any one human being in one paragraph. But kudos to Jonathan for giving us this very helpful definition. Another thing that Pastor Jonathan highlighted is, is that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And as the pastoral staff were talking, Pastor Jan uh, emphasized that piece. And it's a very important part of understanding the gospel. So in, under, in order to understand the gospel, we need to appreciate and value and understand the Jewishness of Jesus. And in particular, how the coming of Jesus, the incarnation of Jesus, is really really found throughout the entirety of the text of the Bible, Old and New Testaments. And in the Old Testament, in a few places, we get some seemingly kind of subtle, gentle hints about the coming of the Messiah. Uh, they're often uh, in short statements that really are, are completely packed with meaning. And they are part of where we find the gospel in the Old Testament. And uh, one of the passages that was read earlier uh, in Genesis 3, after the creation of humankind, Adam and Eve sin by doing precisely what they are told not to do. And of course, it's not just uh, God and Adam and Eve there, but Satan is in the garden in the form of a serpent. And it's in, in fact Satan who tempts and capitalizes on Adam's and Eve's willingness to be deceived. And so Satan is a significant player in the narrative. And so here we have the Lord God said to, said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put en enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heal. And so we see Satan's punishment in the manner in which he is to exist on the earth in a very lowly form as a snake. This is, of course, creative and poetic language, but we really need to take the point seriously. And then we see the gospel here in this passage in the Old Testament when God makes a promise that there will be enmity uh, or uh, active opposition. Enmity is active opposition between Satan and the woman in particular, and, and in particular between Satan and the offspring, the offspring of the woman. So Eve was the mother of all humankind, right? She was a very important figure, and her offspring ultimately is the Messiah who was born of a woman. And what do we see happening to Satan and between Satan and the woman's offspring? The Messiah. Satan will strike the Messiah's heel, while the Messiah will crush Satan's head, right? So the Messiah will be injured, perhaps severely, but injury is different from destruction. Satan will be destroyed. 
And this, of course, is fleshed out in the crucifixion, but then more importantly, in the resurrection of Jesus and in Jesus' defeat of Satan on the cross, where Jesus defeats death. So this is very, very early, early on in the story of God, right? In God's story in Genesis. But even here, we see Jesus as victor. The good news here, the first good news here is spoken about Jesus to our first mother, Eve. God promised that Jesus would be born of a woman, would grow to be a man who would do battle with Satan and stomp his head and defeat him. And so, as a result, liberate people from their captivity to Satan, to sin, uh, to death, and hell through the substitutionary death of the Messiah. So even in this really very dark moment, there's so much in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 that is very, very beautiful. And, and we see God's joy and his pleasure over his creation. So it's really good to dwell on Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. But, but even here... In Genesis 3, this is an incredibly dark moment recorded uh, in, in human history. Um, this is literally the fall of humanity, the fall of humanity, where there is this breach in relationship with God and his human creation, and where the beautiful fellowship between God and Adam and Eve in the garden uh, is broken. We see that. We see that darkness. But then we see this glimmer of light as well. We see hope. We see this hint of good news. We see the gospel. Now, nine chapters later, just nine chapters later in Genesis 12, from the passage that, are, that was read earlier by Sharon, um, we have the statement where God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So early on here, again, in the story of Genesis, at the calling of Abraham, who was known as Abram at the time, we see the extent, the extent of the blessing that will come to humanity and through Abraham. So far from the later understanding that the Jewish people developed of their kind of exclusive chosenness as a people of God, we see that God intends his blessing to be extended to all people on earth through Jesus. And so how is this an expression of the gospel in the Old Testament? Well, again, the Hebrews considered themselves to be the main receivers. They were actually the initial receivers of God's blessing, and so that they were the, ex the exclusive chosen people of God at that time, meaning that everybody who was not Jewish, the vast majority of humanity, was left out, out in the cold, out of God's plan to redeem the world and to have a people for his own. But we see, even in this passage here, that God's intention is that all peoples on earth would be blessed. The blessing of all humanity. And that we find ultimately fulfilled in the gospel. As a very familiar passage, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. So we see here that God is not just interested in one particular group in a particular geographic area at a particular time in history, although for sure, for sure, he begins his saving plan with them, and they are and remain a key part of his plan. But God is interested in all people. He extends his blessing, his grace, his loving kindness to all people. And so all people have the opportunity to be enfolded into the love of God in Christ. All people have the opportunity to be enfolded into the love of God in Christ. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation without exception is extended this invitation into relationship with God, this invitation to salvation, to this restored relationship with the living God. This is the gospel in the old Testament. This is the good news that is embedded in these ancient texts that we should pay very close attention to and be aware of. And there are other instances in the book of Genesis and throughout the, the, the narrative of the Old Testament where the gospel is found. And we don't have a whole lot of time to go into that right now, although in the Bible study following today's service and in the Thursday online Bible chat, we will go into more depth. But very quickly, we see um, Moses 
right? Moses is a key figure. He's the author of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And we see Jesus typified in the life of Moses. Moses is considered the deliverer and the law giver. So in Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, we see the Passover lamb introduced as the sign of God's deliverance and salvation for the nation of Israel. We see the Passover lamb introduced and was very effective um, as the means of delivering uh, the people of God from the, the plagues, the, the, the final plague that was going to hit them at the time in history. And then in John 129, we see the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is the Lamb of God, the ultimate Passover Lamb the ultimate Passover land, and his impact is to take away the sin of the world. And then in, in Exodus 16, uh, we read about God sending manna from heaven. The, the people of Israel are kind of wandering in the desert, kind of wandering a little bit um, kind of circuitously, shall we say, and, uh, and they're griping about the lack of what the food. And so God sends manna from heaven to the people of Israel as they wander in the desert, again, after complaining about their hunger. And God miraculously, literally provides quite yummy food that falls from the sky, and they're able to make all kinds of stuff from it, right? So this idea of manna from heaven. So in John 6, we see Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So we see these connections happening between the Old and New Testament. It's really one big story. And then in Exodus, when uh, the people complain about thirst, Moses strikes the rock, right? And then water comes out. In 1 Corinthians 10, the apostle Paul talks about they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, and they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ, so I want to mention as well that Jesus makes it really just very clear that the Old Testament speaks about him. Uh, in John has, uh, Jesus has this very long dialogue with the Pharisees in the book of John. It's fascinating to read and to pick up on the gradually increasing intensity of the conversation. Fairly early on in the, co in the conversation, Jesus says this. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, Jesus says, right? The, the word scriptures here refers to the Jewish scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. So Jesus is saying that the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, our scriptures, um, take it as a whole to witness to Jesus. And then in verse 46, uh, he says it again a little bit differently. He says, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Right? So verse 46 says really clearly that, that Moses wrote about Jesus. And, and, uh, and then verse 39 says that the scriptures witness about Jesus. Right? So when Jesus says about the scriptures that, that, um, oops, that it is they that bear witness to me, he means that God knew Jesus perfectly and fully, as it were, face to face, and that he inspired these scriptures, and through these scriptures revealed Jesus. Jesus was the ultimate point of the scriptures. God said things and did things in the scriptures which, if had been understood by the people to which they were directed, they would have given them a glimpse of Jesus and would have prepared them to recognize him and receive him when they came. And of course, the first 5,000 uh, followers of Jesus were, in fact, Jewish. Now, when we jump ahead, so we're just really dealing so far with the Torah, right? So with the first five books of the Bible. But when we jump ahead to the prophets, we get some more pretty startling and clear descriptions of the gospel in the Old Testament. Um, the people in Isaiah 9, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. 
here we, we see the statement that, that those in darkness, walking in darkness, whose experience of being alive is filled with darkness, those people are seeing a great light, right? Goodness that's obscured and hidden by darkness is revealed. A light has dawned. What is that light? A few verses later, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called, this child will be called, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The child born, the child to be born, the child in prophecy is the mighty God, the everlasting Father. This is the incarnation. This is the incarnation. This is God coming to us in the flesh. He is the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace, everlasting father. He is the Messiah. And this is another example of the gospel in the Old Testament. All of, of these are really examples of the gospel in the Old Testament. And those examples of the gospel in the Old Testament, they're sometimes short, they're sometimes pithy, they're sometimes kind of cloaked in poetic language, um, or partly, partly poetic language, as in Genesis 3, and they're sometimes longer, bold statements, that, as here in Isaiah 9. And there are sometimes very lengthy paragraphs. Um, the end of Isaiah 52 and, Isaiah, and then all of Isaiah 53, there is an explicitly detailed uh, prediction, prophecy about the Messiah that is glaringly, obviously, about Jesus. It talks about the one who will take um, on himself our iniquities, all of our sins, who will pay the punishment for our sin. Just a, just a few verses from Isaiah 53. Um, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. We'll be looking at this passage and others in more detail in the Bible studies uh, following today. Uh, but So it's extremely important to understand that the gospel, the good news, the good news of Jesus, is all over the whole Bible. The gospel is in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. It is in the New Testament. We must understand and appreciate the Jewishness of Jesus that he is a Jewish Messiah who fulfilled all the prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament. And through faith in Christ, through believing in the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins, we are brought into a re living relationship with a living uh, God. And th so this is the gospel. This is the gospel that makes true this statement, and that is that you are the beloved adopted child of the Most High King of the Universe. This is a gospel that makes true the fact that you are the beloved, adopted child of the Most High King of the universe, not of ourselves. None of us has done anything or could possibly do anything to earn anything remotely close to that. It is pure gift. So we need to reclaim our understanding of the Jewishness of Jesus. And in fact, it's really only possible, I think, to understand and deeply appreciate the gift that the gospel is to us when we place it in this context of the history of the people of God that we find in the Old Testament. It's one of the reasons why we, we, we do so much kind of Bible reading. We, we read the Bible in a year, and a lot of us are, are really kind of immersed in this. I read the Bible in a year because it's the only way that I can keep track of the whole broad a narrative I, I would forget otherwise. When it comes to the New Testament, to the New Testament, of course, the gospel is all over the New Testament. In fact, the first four books of the New Testament are called the Gospels of 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? So these are the eyewitness accounts that emerged out of the Christian communities in the first century, in the decades after the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And each of these Gospels, each of these Gospels, which I hope you're, you're in some regular pattern of reading, um, gives a unique and yet harmonious description of Jesus. Four different guys, four different perspectives, talking about one guy, wonderfully... Uh, um, colorful and, and diverse, and the way that you would have, like, say, four people know Pastor Jan, but four people talk about Pastor Jan, they're going to give different perspectives, depending on how, uh, the, uh, you know, her life impacted our lives, so that we have that uh, in the Bible, uh, which, which is remarkable. And, um, and, uh, and, and then we have the letters of Paul, we have the letters of Paul, um, and statements that, l that directly link the gospel back to the Old Testament. And so here we have in 1 Corinthians 15, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man, Adam, was the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. As is the heavenly man, so are also those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Right? And so we have, we have this. We have the first man, Adam, becoming the living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The Adam that we find in early Genesis, the first man, became or was made a living being. The last Adam, the Messiah, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. And so there's this correlation, the first Adam and the last Adam, the first man and the Messiah, Jesus. And then we have the spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. And we have descriptions of the origins of both Adam and Jesus. Adam was formed of the dust of the earth. Christ, the second man, the second Adam, came from heaven to earth in the incarnation. And as was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is a heavenly man, so are those who have heaven, are of heaven. And just as we have borne born the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. This is interesting. We have the earthly man, Adam, and then we have all those who are like him, which of course includes everybody in this room and everybody else on the planet. And as Jesus is, the, is of heaven, we, we also, who have faith in Jesus, are of heaven. Philippians makes that very clear. Our citizenship is in heaven. It's from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So I think we need to end there. This is obviously a very thick and dense kind of topic. Um, but for those who are interested, we can pick up the discussion um, a little bit later in the Bible study that will follow the service in the room just down the hall. And um, if you are helping with cleanup, uh, feel free just to drop in afterwards. Um, and again, we're, we're going to be discussing some of these matters uh, in some depth on Thursday uh, in our online Bible study, which we hope you'll consider joining as well. But, so what do we do with all this? What do we do with all this? I admit it's a lot. I also admit that I barely scratched the surface of all that is there to help us to understand the gospel. Let's go back to Pastor Jonathan's uh, summary of the gospel. The loving creator God is restoring his creation through the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. And we can be part of it. And so those last six words is how we can maybe wrap up for now. The gospel of Christ, the immense hope that God offers to humanity in bringing restoration to all things and salvation from sin for all people through faith in Jesus and his suffering, death, and resurrection, that gospel is something that we can be personally a part of sharing. You can be personally a part of sharing. We can be part of it. We're called by God, actually, to be a part of it as the church. And we're equipped by God with the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, individually and collectively, to be part of it and to be able to share this amazing good news with those that we come into contact with, right? Our families, our friends, our acquaintances, each of those groups present unique challenges when we're sharing our faith. 
Next week, we're going to look more into the topic of sharing faith, of evangelism. And the week after that, we're going to be looking at precisely how it is that we can share our faith. Uh, if you join the Bible studies after the service and online on Thursday mornings, you're going to learn in more detail and then actually have opportunities to develop your own approach, this very you, to sharing your faith in different situations. And you'll even have time to practice, if you wish, what you would share as you share your faith. And so hopefully we will grow together in our understanding of and our appreciation for the gospel. You know, before I became a Christian, at the age of 17, I really came to believe that nothing mattered, that life had no real meaning or purpose, and it didn't help that I, let, I read a lot of depressed German philosophers. I struggled deeply with a sense of pointlessness in my life, and I heard from others who shared my views at the time, uh, sure, life is meaningless, but life is what you make it, as if that was some great statement. They were probably trying to help, but those words and that attitude left me cold. And I was shocked out of my unbelief as I discovered the gospel, as I believed for the first time that Jesus died for my sins because he loved me. I was shocked out of my unbelief. And then I began to adjust to the reality that far, far from life being pointless and purposeless and full of empty suffering, the truth is that God and life as God intends it is quite the opposite, actually entirely the opposite. Life is loaded with meaning and purpose and joy even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of suffering because and only because the gospel is true. The gospel is the most beautiful expression of the heart of God. His love, his loving kindness, his active engagement and empathy and entering into the struggle of humanity in Jesus Christ. So may we, along with all who love Jesus Christ, come to more fully and more personally embrace life's deepest and fullest meaning as we seek to live out the gospel and seek to be available to God to share the truth of what he has done for us in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your, for your word. We thank you for the good news of Jesus. We thank you for this uh, remarkable thing that we have discovered that you have revealed to us, Lord. And we're still trying to, uh, 43 years later, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around, around the fullness and beauty of the gospel. God, and it excites me to no end. Lord, may we, as your people here at Young Street Mission, at Church of the Mission, may our hearts be uh, stirred, Lord, to, to um, just uh, celebrate and, and, gl and glorify your name and make ourselves uh, willing to be present, God, to you as you, by your spirit, seek to work through us. And even as we worship you now, Lord, may you stimulate our hearts, God, to, to, to joy and excitement and, uh, and just to, to know your pleasure as we celebrate the gospel in your holy name. Amen.